presentation. Um, today we have Dr. Carlos Monroy from the Department of Computer Science at Rice University. Uh, thank you, Leticia, for inviting me. Um, it's always a pleasure to share some ideas and some thoughts about the work that I'm doing, some of the things that I've been working for the past few years with the Tapia Center here at Rice. Uh, so today I will talk about um, this concept of data curation. And so the title of my presentation is The, er the Art of Data Curation, uh, People, Technology and Data. And I think that this is very uh, relevant in the context of uh, this um, emerging uh, field of data science. Um, what you see here is um, this um, uh, book, is the, 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 this book uh, he, uh, entitled Hidden Figures. Um, this is uh, the base of a movie that I haven't seen, but I, I've heard uh, a lot about it. And it's the story of this uh, group of African-American women who did a lot of uh, computation and calculations for um, enabling and helping uh, for NASA to have uh, astronauts on the moon. Um, I find it very interesting, uh, not only because it's a very powerful story, but because it's a combination of uh, people on the one hand, as well as technology and data, which is the uh, focus of my, of my presentation. All right, so I will start off by, uh, these are the main points of what I will go through today. I will start by uh, giving a aesthetics uh, point of view regarding data, uh, the beauty of data. I will then dive into some of the diverse data sets that I uh, have worked and I'm working presently. And along those lines, uh, my journey with data curation and how that enables analytics in general. How this, uh, then how this ties into this age of data science. And as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, how this is possible because of the interconnections among people, uh, technology, and data. And some of the final thoughts and lessons uh, learned. So what you see here is a photograph from the Hubble telescope. Um, this was um, shown at a presentation that I attended a, uh, probably three years ago. It was by a scientist from the Hubble Telescope in Maryland, Washington. And what you see here is one of the, uh, it's a nebula. And it is really a portrait of millions and billions of data points that uh, represent a countless stars and celestial objects and uh, from from outer space, and what I was say very interesting is that when this uh, the speaker was going through this photograph, is if you think for a moment the beauty that is that comes out of all this data, it's a really fantastic and phenomenal um, uh, picture. This is Massimo Roberto. This is the person who gave the the talk, and I would like to uh, bring your attention to the first uh, paragraph, the end of the first paragraph on the um, uh, this Hubble panoramic view of uh, that kind of like text that you see in 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 brown. So it says this turbulent star formation region is one of the ast of astronomy's most dramatic and photogenic celestial objects. So if we think for a moment. Uh, he, this, uh, this person who wrote this uh, sentence is talking in terms of almost if what is this picture has a, has a personality, is a person, is dramatic and is photogenic. And again, I think that as um, we work with uh, data sets, this is something that we as researchers, um, as humans in general, uh, will find in the end is we try to find some beauty. What is the data is telling us? So I will start off by uh, digging into the etymology, the origin of, of the term data curation. This is a painting by uh, E. Hopper. It's called uh, Cape Cod Morning. And what you see is a woman who is looking at the window. So this person, this woman is looking at a window with something that is uh, out there. Uh, could be a sunset, could be the beauty of the landscape, maybe it's, a, it's the sea. But nonetheless, what is she is that uh, she's captured in this beauty that it comes from something that um, that is out there, something that is giving. And the word data comes from the Latin datum, 
which means that of given, something that is given, that I haven't put in there. But nonetheless, I'm observing. The second part of the definition is the word curation, which works from Latin uh, cura, uh, curare, which means take care of. This is a painting by Fields. It's called The Doctor. And what you see is in the middle of the painting is a child who is sick. The doctor is there, uh, very attentive, looking at the child. And in the background, the parents are uh, concerned about, about the, the health of the child. So what this painting uh, portrayed is something is people taking care of another person, curare, taking care of. So in this regard, I will the definition that I will give to data curation is a concern for something beautiful and valuable that is giving, basically what data is given to me. And uh, in this context, then we are stewards of this data. We are uh, stewards of this repository that as we will uh, move in my presentation, you will see, will help us to answer questions, to find, uh, to de make discoveries, and to advance knowledge. So we are stewards of this reality. Now, data in itself has a value. This is a seminal paper written by uh, uh, Sergey Brin and uh, Lawrence Page, which are the founders of um, Google, as you will uh, expect. Now, back in the late 98, uh, 90s, specifically I believe it's uh, 98, they came, they came up with this clever idea of finding a way to rank and measure all the pages out there on the internet. And that's what led eventually to the, the implementation and the creation of this page rank algorithm. That is what really Mm, mm, is the engine under the hood uh, for Google, for at least for initially how Google uh, create the way in which they created their search engine. Now it has evolved into a extremely sophisticated um, search engine now with uh, figures, video, images, maps, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, the point here is that there is an intrinsic value on that data. And that's what we, as again, as researchers, as scholars, we will find as we uh, work on our, on our different uh, projects. So the first project that I will um, discuss is this uh, project uh, on nautical archaeology. This was a project that basically was trying to help archaeologists in the reconstruction of sunken ships. So the photograph that you see here on, your, on, your, uh, on the left is an underwater excavation. It's um, a vessel that uh, uh, archaeologists uh, go underwater. They take photographs. They take notes. They record video. And they catalog all the parts of the ship. On the other side, what you see is a, a design. It's a representation or an abstraction of that, uh, of what they found on, on the field. Now, there was one. A, archaeologist who has this, this quote that you see at the top that says, piles of rotten timbers and broken artifacts constitute a wealth of information. Yet much of that knowledge will remain unrecognized unless one develops a proper method of access to it. And I think that this is exactly what we find when we are uh, working with data sets. They could be complex data sets, could be small, simple, big, it doesn't matter. Whatever data sets that we work with, is we are trying to make sense um, what is in there, but we need to have a method uh, to catalog and access them. So in this regard, nautical archaeology is a, as a science, it studies uh, the remains of boats and ships, but not only that, but also the cultures that created and used them. Now, I think that this is very important because when we start um, doing research and for which we use and rely or, or rely, uh, rely on data is not only the data in itself that we are focusing. There is a, an overall context that is very important for where we are trying the questions that we are trying to to answer. Um, this is a quote by Forte uh, who says to enhance the he's, he is talking about the the reconstruction of um, of in, in the case of archaeologists. But it says, the, one of the goals is to enhance and direct, and direct cognitive perceptions of antiquity. So these are all things 
that with these reconstructions is trying to bring our, our cognitive perceptions to what once existed but doesn't exist anymore. But there is one thing that uh, can be dangerous and that's the quote at the bottom or my comment at the bottom which says however they can have lives of their own. The idea here is that when we abstract a reality and we create a representation could be a mathematical model, uh, could be a, um, a drawing or a sketch, if it's not fully supported or we can, we lack a tracking back to the original data, those artifacts or those representations or, or abstractions uh, can have lives of their own. They, they maybe are not necessarily a, a faithful representation of, of that original uh, reality. So one of the things that, uh, in the case of nautical archaeology, one of the goals was to reconstruct a ship. So what you see here is a, a scholar who is uh, creating a, a model, a wooden model of an existing, of an old uh, uh, shipwreck. And in order to do this, this archaeology has to rely on different sources of information. So what you see here are some photographs for um, from artifacts or pieces of ships from other ships that have been recovered. So archaeologists take pictures of them, as I mentioned before, they uh, add notes about them, they describe them, their properties, their dimensions, but also they rely on some models, and that, that's the, the graph that you see on your on the left. This is a, um, a 3D image representation of a, of a different vessel. They also rely on other models and also on um, manuscripts that describe the construction of ships. Keep in mind that these are ship, uh, ship, ships that were built in the 18th, 17th, 16th century. So those are those are all uh, different types of information that they use in order to uh, understand and reconstruct a, a ship. Here are some um, uh, shipbuilding treatises. I will uh, talk in, in the next slide. But these are basically, imagine a textual, a textual manual that describes the steps uh, that are needed in order to uh, build a ship. And this, in, in the case uh, of the project I was working on at that time, they were written in different languages. So this is what I'm, uh, what I'm, I'm talking about. This is a, an image of a, I believe it's a 17 Portuguese uh, treatise, like I mentioned before, is think of, of a treatise uh, as a technical manual that describes all the different steps and properties and dimensions. Sometimes they had corrections uh, because those, these are manuscripts. So think about this as a versioning, kind of like a versioning. But they also have uh, sequences of constructions. So this, in a, in a sense, in, in, in my view, are really, it's, an, it's really an algorithm because there are steps uh, on how to construct a, a ship. They also uh, include within the text proportions, geometric proportions that are uh, related to uh, some figures. So that's the the relationship that you see between these ovals in different colors and the and the brackets at the at the bottom. So here the challenge is linking these two representations. You have a graphic representation and you have a textual representation in addition to uh, steps in building the, the ships as well in different versions. One more challenge with that project was that these these uh, uh, shipbuilding treatises needed to be also linked to other uh, building uh, shipbuilding treatises. So, linking different manuals. That's how they, the uh, the archaeologists will rely on, so on on information. So you see here, for example, uh, two illustrations from two different uh, from two different uh, printed books. Um, although both are in Portuguese, but they correspond to perhaps different type of vessels. But again, the idea here is that they need to link these uh, uh, different uh, visual representations in order to better understand a ship that they are uh, working on at a given time. And again, the challenge with this particular project was that we had manuscripts written in different languages, Portuguese, Italian, Latin, Dutch, uh, French, to name a few. So 
once the data was uh, was prepared, then I was able to build this um, uh, interface. What you see here is an, a web-based interface that was under the hood uh, querying uh, uh, those texts. And it was able to bring text uh, across all different languages. But this rely on one of the challenges, another challenge with this project was that as one scholar mentioned at, uh, at a given point was that the some of the terms, nautical terms, specifically in that period of time, um, are different than what we know, what in modern times we know about those terms. So this is again uh, the evolution of the change in the meaning on, 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 of some terms. A second challenge was that the some of the, there was no uh, a, a link, one-to-one -one link between languages. For example, he mentioned that it, um, anchors, for instance, in medieval times and the age of exploration were actually a complex, uh, more complex artifacts. So these things, again, it, it illustrate some of the challenges when we are dealing with data. Another important thing is what I'm seeing, what I'm showing here is um, a very integrated uh, interface. Here are uh, some of the translations, and again, we did some of the of the translations was done in automatic fashion, but as, given some of the difficulties and the challenges that I uh, mentioned um, earlier, we have to rely on a manually curated um, multilingual um, dictionary, and we had about 30 people editing this dictionary, which encompassed 12 different languages. Uh, included synonyms, definitions, as well as uh, different um, spellings of the words. So with this, um, then once these, so think for a moment that before this um, uh, prototype was uh, was created, they had to manually go to boxes of um, photographs, go to uh, bring some of the documents in order to examine them as a way to understand the a ship that they were studying. In contrast, this interface that relied on a very, very well curated data set was uh, improving the way in which they could query the information. So they had better context. So you can see here that they can, again, bring similar terms. They have illustrations, they have text, they have definitions in different languages, and they can also go and look for uh, a specific text describing uh, a ship. Again, translations. The second, um, second thing that we did was that instead of just relying on, on, the, on the terms in itself, like for example, one way to look at that is what is called co-occurrence of terms. For example, if uh, one term, for, uh, for instance, stern, stern, stern post, um, it was found that uh, those stern post and rabbit, for instance, was occurring very often uh, with kill in the same context, for, for example, within the same paragraph. So one way to uh, use um, some information retrieval techniques and indexing techniques here is to use that as a way to say, okay, if they occur very often, most likely they are related in some way. However, the problem is that it is not known in what way they are related. So that's the reason why we build uh, what is called an ontology. The ontology gives a semantic, a, 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 more, a richer and semantic um, representation of how these terms are related to each other. Just to give an example here, you see those uh, red circles, or, uh, red ovals, and those correspond to plank and planking. So planking, for example, is a technique uh, that uses plank. Plank uh, are related to other different parts. It could be made out of different types of wood. Different techniques can be used to assemble those planks to other parts of the uh, of the vessel, and so on and so forth. Again, here the the, the lesson from from this slide is the need of expanding, uh, finding new ways for enriching the way in which information is both indexed and retrieved. Okay, so let me shift gears from the first project. Um, I also work on a very large, um, I wouldn't say huge collection, but it was large and it was really complex and it was a really, really cool collection of Picasso's artworks. 
um, what you see here is a, um, some some thumbnails of um, paintings of Picasso. So Picasso, it is believed that Picasso created about 80, 85,000 pieces of artwork. So the problem, uh, this scholar in the, this was in the Hispanic Studies Department at Texas A&M, the problem he was facing was uh, the following. He was cataloging these, um, um, these artworks, and as you imagine, at that, and he had a website, so that's what you see here, but this is not the original website. He, has a, he had a website with those images, and also an extensive uh, and rich historical narrative. That's the text that you see on on the on your left on on your left on the right of your of your screen. At the top, you see a it's just a um, some metadata about a given um, painting from the thumbnails. For example, the materials that was used, the technique, when was painted, dimensions, and so on and so forth. Now, the challenge was uh, on the one hand. He was at that time, he had already cataloged about 4,000 images, and it was becoming very, very hard. This is just the manual way of adding things to the collection. But the, he was trying to answer uh, more uh, deeper questions. For example, how images and how the artistic life of Picasso was related to his life. So that's the reason of linking this historical narrative. And that includes, for example, um, places where Picasso lived at a given time, that's what you see on this uh, on this section that I just highlighted now, as well as people he was in contact with. Because the the hypothesis is that some of these events in in the artist's life, for example, places where places where he was living or people he knew, impacted his uh, his paintings. And from the other perspective is how can we arrive to the influences of these people or locations from the paintings? And this is what. Uh, by having this very um, rich and very well curated data set, we started to look at uh, answering these questions. Another question was, for example, try to find the similarities uh, between different uh, periods of his of his artistic creation. There is. Um, we also work on another. This is a different project. This is on on. Mm, Linguistics computing. This is um, some. Uh, uh, it's a poetry of a uh, seventeen poet John Donne. I did not anything about him in the past, but it seems to it seems for what I understand that is a very important in English literature. So this um, one of the the goals of the of these um, scholars was trying to identify the differences among all. Uh, printed books of this poetry, because there were differences. Even though that they were uh, printed books, the copies uh, contained uh, different versions. So the, one of the questions is why is that some of the of the copies have differences and they are not all the same. Now an interesting thing here with this um, collection was to that it was not just a digital version. It also include a uh, a printed book. So this is really the combining both traditional and, and digital scholarship. And it was a very, a, a very, very interesting uh, project. And also show um, the beauty that these uh, scholars working on this project was putting on, on cataloging and curating this, this data set. All right. So I will move to a next stage on my my um, this journey that I mentioned at, at the beginning in terms of uh, of um, using data. So in 2013, I was selected to participate on this data intensive uh, ideas lab sponsored by NSF. So we were uh, a group of probably 50, 40, 50 people in different areas of of, of learning and, and education. Um, one of the, the of the ideas was on how to leverage data in order to improve the ways in which we teach and learn, and teaching and learning understood in very broad sense, not just in the traditional one, meaning in a classroom, but how we how we learn, for example, a scientist doing research is learning, a someone doing a, an online uh, course, for example, is also learning. So both in formal and informal settings, and this uh, lifelong uh, trajectory of learning. So that was kind of idea. So one of the the things that came to my mind was 
to came up with this notion of learn, what they call learning informatics. And the idea for learning informatics is to have a very similar approach of what has been done in bioinformatics. There was, there's going to be a, a slide later on on my talk in which I will highlight some of the uh, tremendous advancements in, in bioinformatics that have been possible because of data curation. So again, the idea was of using a very similar approach for learning data. And in this context, uh, we have this, I, I start working on this area called learning analytics. That is the collection and analysis on and measuring the data about learners, as well as the context uh, where, it, where it takes place, this learning takes place. As a result of that, I participated in a couple of, of events. Uh, this is what you see here, this learning analytics uh, conference where we it presented some of the work we were doing on a, a large-scale analytics for a, a online science curriculum that I will be talking in just a couple of minutes. Um, one of the things that I learned out of this um, ideas lab, NSF ideas lab, was um, this um, established uh, data shop. That's what you see at the bottom. It's called uh, PSLC Data Shop. This is a collaborative effort at Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh. And it's a place where uh, people who have collected or have data pertaining to learning, um, they can upload the data sets and they are curated. So the research uh, can go and use the data to develop new methods or answer uh, different uh, questions. But it, this is possible because uh, someone has taken the time and the effort to have a very well curated uh, repository of, of data. So this is a, uh, just a definition of this uh, concept of learning informatics. As I mentioned, it's very it's similar to what bioinformatics and, has done, and system biology has done. It's uh, connecting all the dots. So, how I came to to work on, on learning analytics and in analyzing data uh, from learning spaces. So this is a um, screenshot of a game of a group I previously worked here at Rice, and it was a, a, um, a forensic science game based on the show CSI. The basic idea is that players will navigate through different locations. They will collect um, evidence. They will bring to the lab. That's the lab that you see here in this uh, in this picture. They will process that evidence, and they will come up with clues. So what they are doing with this is really doing the scientific method. But as they were navigating through this uh, through this path, they were um, exploring. A, they were doing a problem solving. So the question we came up with was: Well, can we analyze some of the of that data in order to better understand? How are they? How are they doing? Uh, how they are approaching this uh, this problem solving space? So, just to give you a, um, <clears throat> one example, we look. One of the first question we were trying to answer was, what are the places in the game where players are um, most are most often they stop? And this is what you see in this uh, graph. On the x-axis are the different uh, locations in the game or steps on the game. On the x-axis are a uh, number of, of players, and this is for a study we conducted. So you see a very large uh, bar almost at the beginning. And that was uh, the number of players, in the, again, in this study, where the number of players stopped at that point. We, we found out that it was because um, that was a location that was a little bit complicated. They had to collect three different pieces of evidence. So probably was a little bit hard, and therefore they will Quit there. Then we'll, we can see that after one, most of, um, approximately one third of the game, um, they will not, with a couple of exceptions, they will most likely not quit. So it could be that at that point they have reached a certain uh, degree of engagement in the game. There could be one, one way to look at that. Or the other could be that they are, and therefore they are more confident with what they are doing and therefore most likely to, to complete. But again, this is just to illustrate the power of data in order to understand this, uh, this game. Another question that we were exploring was, for example, could, be, could we use this data to find places on, within the game 
that perhaps are not well designed, that that could be the reason why they are uh, quitting at a given point. Another project um, within this, uh, in the context of learning, was this science learning science curriculum. Uh, it was called, it's called STEM scopes. This was at the time um, is a very a robust pedagogical framework um, that supports this curriculum. It's called the 5E plus AI framework, and the 5E stands for engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. So I will explain a little bit what in more detail what this means. Uh, what this means is that what you see here in this picture is imagine a, for a given class the different topics that the instructor will cover uh, in the school year or the semester. So this is, for example, change from heat. Now the instructor can follow and use different resources, and that's what all you see on that list on your left. But each one of those resources is based on a pedagogical uh, framework or, or theory. And the idea here is that you will use a, a ways for in, to engage students, then let them explore the content, then the instructor will jump in and uh, be more involved to correct misconceptions and direct the, the, the understanding. Then they will make connections to other uh, topics as the elaborate step, and then you will evaluate. That basically is a test or a, a some hands-on activity. Um, so this is, this is what the, the, this curriculum was about. We had about uh, half a million users, about 45,000 in addition to those other students, plus 40, about 45,000 uh, teachers. They were, one of the reasons we were planning on using this data was because in addition to these five steps, there was also a, two other additional steps, intervention and acceleration. Intervention were resources geared to students who, have, who are struggling so that they can um, they can be presented with ma with materials to to help them to to go um, to advance. Acceleration, on the other hand, are materials and resources for students who are mastering some concepts, so they can be presented with more challenging uh, resources. One of the uh, challenges we face with uh, with this, and this is in in the team I was working with, we have people from as mentioned from pedagogy, from education. I was on the computer. Uh, com computer science uh, standpoint. But one of the challenges is that there were so many questions that were uh, needed to answer. And it, bec it became evident from the beginning that it was really challenging to extract data, to modify data, to slide data, prepare different data sets, to do all sort of, anal of analytics. So I, we've, I found this uh, tool. It's an open source tool called uh, Pentaho that allows um, allows users to extract, transform, and, and load data. So that's ba this is basically the workflow in, in this data analytics setting. It's basically, we have different sources. We extract the data from there. We have to clean the data, uh, remove outliers, um, uh, create new, new features, then put it in some way uh, in a different place so that, that that can be analyzed. So that's what the, you see on the, on the bottom of the screen is, all this workflow is needed in order to reach the point in which I as a user can explore this data set and make inferences or answer questions. I'm not going to go in detail with this slide, but we, um, one of the, the challenges, again, is on, on finding different ways to, to combine data. So we came up with different uh, combinations. Uh, in this case, we um, de developed these inquiry learning indices. Uh, these are for just a, a plots of different, of some of the five steps and combination of these steps that I mentioned in, one, in my previous slide. Um, but really quick, I would like to bring your attention to the uh, green, um, the green um, rectangle at the bottom. One of the uh, ideas that people uh, in pedagogy told us was that in roughly, mo they, this instructor should be devoting between 25 to 35 percent to inquiry-related resources. And that's what we found, at least on the engage, explore, and explain um, steps, which was good. And it, it should be in combination uh, between two-thirds of the, of the steps. And in our case, in, at least for this study that we conducted, we have a 70 percent. Uh, so it's roughly in that, in, that, um, in that range. Again, the point I'm trying to make here is how the power of data 
of visualizing this data and combining data in different ways to start answering questions. Uh, this is just um, uh, heat maps to illustrate um, both elementary schools and middle schools. Ele elementary schools are the ones in blue, middle schools the ones in red. And what we wanted to look is to have a, a very, not a dramatic uh, contrast of, of a heat map, but rather something that is kind of like what you see on the elementary schools, where teachers, the usage of different resources for all the different students, so that's what, I'm sorry, for the teachers that you see on, on these graphs, are pretty much the same. On the other hand, for the middle schools, you see that there is more, um, there is more contrast. That means that some steps were used uh, not in a very unif un uniform way. Again, the point here is to illustrate how the, the, the power of data and, and visualization in order to understand this, this setting. Another way of using or leveraging this data is to, for visualization. Here is um, a snapshot of a prototype that we developed and represents students as the list that you see on, on the rows. The columns correspond to different science topics. The color of the arrows uh, and the way they are pointing, green means that the student is advancing from the previous uh, step, from, from the previous snapshot, or uh, they are going down from the previous snapshot. And this was a uh, visualization that will help uh, teachers in order to better uh, monitor the students and, and improve the instruction. You see that, you notice that the students are color. The idea for this is that the colors represent the different um, uh, levels of uh, response for intervention, meaning students who are already master content or the ones who are struggling. And therefore, how I as instructor can tender to those um, to those needs. The, some of the, the equations or some of the formulas that you see at the top is just to point out that under the hood, these numbers or this visualization that you see here is possible because there is a lot of computation that take place uh, under the hood. Um, so these are some of the, of the projects that I had worked. Then I, I kind of move to the end of my talk. I, this is a, a, a snapshot from uh, the AMP lab at UC Berkeley on the data science. And I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my presentation that I really like this idea of the combination of data, uh, people, and technology. At, in the case of UC Berkeley, they call this uh, uh, the AMP lab. It's for um, algorithms, machine, and people. And the, the idea for this combination, I believe, is from this um, theory that is called sociotechnical approach. And this is a, a group that I, um, for which I, I participate with NSF. And the idea, again, is the, that when looking at, at systems is to look at these combinations. Uh, some data trends that I've seen uh, happening is, for example, there is this publication, um, this uh, journal published by uh, Nature. It's called Scientific Data. Um, and it, one of the goals, as you can see from this, um, from this um, text, uh, it says scientific data primarily publishes data descriptors. And this is, this is a, the, their claim is that it's a new, it's a new type of publication. And they have this, uh, this descriptions of research data sets. Um, and the idea is this data descriptors focus on helping others to reuse data rather than testing hypotheses or representing new interpretations, methods, or in-depth analysis. So again, is how this data can be reused. This is possible because the data is properly curated, is properly identified, and has a way to trace back the, 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 its provenance. Um, this is in another example, is the NSDL, this is the National Science Digital Library. In one of the groups I previously worked with, we were, um, we were able to put some of the resources uh, in a way that the NSDL is, a, I believe that it was every week, they were automatically harvesting metadata from our resources and they were populating this. And the idea is for helping uh, teachers all over the U.S. to find materials for, for their teaching needs. And that's the, the reason what you see this in yellow. This is oval there is the different ways in which this data can be, can be searched. Again, this is possible because there is this infrastructure and the data is curated. 
it is an example of one um, of one resource. Okay. Another example is uh, in, bi in biomedical uh, big data. This is a um, report by the NIH, um, the National Institutes of Health, a couple of years, a few years ago. But as after this study, one of the recommendations was the creation of a of a data science of an associate director for data science, and that's. It, I should say that the, the recommendation was on leveraging and use data to advance uh, research and discovery. And one of the recommendations was the creation of this role of Associate Director for Data Science. And it's, it's in place now at NIH. Um, this is, for example, one of their big initiatives is called uh, the Big Data to Knowledge, B BD2K. Uh, and these are some of the uh, uh, recent um, a request for 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 funding, but I would like to illustrate this with these three examples that they are focusing a lot on data science related organizations. So you you know create some infrastructure in this in this uh, context at the level of community. There is also a digital curation for my biomedical big data and metadata and standards efforts. So again, without these. Many of the of the discoveries that they that they are intending to do would not be possible, um, and and all of these if, even if we are in the in, this I think is a slide shot from 2016, but it's still as they mentioned it's still in the early ages of technology. So there's a lot of room and opportunities to work in this. Uh, in in fact, uh, last fall, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden was here at Rice. He talked about this cancer moonshot. One of the main points was on using data and big data for advancing um, cancer research. Uh, this is another um, example on a, a linking deep, very diverse data sets. This is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, just to give you a, a quick uh, highlight of this. These are some of the data sources. This is a, a survey that they have been conducting for the past few years. What they do is that they conduct both in-person uh, in, um, surveys and phone interview, and they also collect data samples from medical and lab tests. And they follow these individuals, and that's how they have all these uh, rich, um, I would say like a snapshot of state of, state of the union health uh, uh, nutrition uh, snapshot. But they are starting to be interested in linking data sets from other sources. For example, data from the uh, USDA, the United States, um, uh, the food and nutrient databases, for example, and uh, different food patterns, and so on and so forth. So again, the idea is starting leverage data to answer uh, wider questions or more um, uh, deeper questions. So. Uh, getting towards the end of my talk, um, I mentioned about some of the success stories um, in biomedical uh, data. This is from the gene expression omnibus. What you see here is a heat map of, I am not an, I will make the disclaimer here that I'm not a, an expert on this, but um, I work on, 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 on a couple of these data sets in the past and I can mention a, a couple of points. So what you see on this heat map is on the rows corresponds to different genes. And the columns correspond to different uh, experimental designs. So that's how these genes have been uh, treated or exposed to different conditions. And the idea is by putting this on this uh, uh, gene expression omnibus, scholars uh, or researchers, they can um, look, for example, of what other people have done in the past. I, one example like that come to my mind is, for example, uh, my wife who's working on, on cancer research, once she put one of the, uh, her studies, she was able to find a study back in 2012 of someone who had demonstrated that the levels on, of oxygen in some, um, on some cells were correlated to a specific uh, genes, which were the genes that she was interested in doing for her research. Again, here the, 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 the case I'm making is without this very well curated data set, this kind of advancement in science would not be possible. Um, and this is, sorry, this is just uh, some of the metadata that is used for when these publications are are, uh, are submitted for public, these articles are submitted for publications that include not only the traditional title, 
um, the different um, um, title and, and author and so on and so forth. But also you have to submit your 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 raw data uh, data from your experimental uh, conditions. Um, one of the projects I worked also in the past was I took a class on machine learning, statistical machine learning, a couple of years ago, in which we had to predict the probability that a patient would be readmitted to a hospital within 30 days after being discharged from the hospital. So we had a training set of about 12,000 patients and a test data set of about 5,000 uh, patients. And these are the, the number of visits, about 15,000 and 6,000 uh, respectively. Now, one of the challenges we faced with this um, was that, in addition to that, for the for those um, data sets, we had about 640,000 test results. So those were triplets: the test code, the day the test was conducted, and the result. And this is just a distribution on some of the on some of the tests. Um, a challenge was that um, we we were not with the the person that I work in this project. We were not experts on on on, biome on, on medical or health data. So one of the first steps for us was to engage people from that community better to understand. And we have to do quite a few work on uh, feature engineering. And that's what some of the, these tables uh, illustrate, some of the, the features of new variables that, did, that we uh, created from the original ones. Um, and we noticed that as we were creating new data, uh, new variables, we created different indices or different combinations of these, uh, these features the models that we were building were changing. We're, we were getting, in some cases, probably worse results or better results. But this, again, illustrates um, and re in, indicates the challenges in, in data-rich environments. It's a, it's a, it's a really beautiful uh, area of, of research, but at the same time requires a lot of trial and error. Um, and this is just a list of some, some of the algorithms that we, that we use. OK. So the final point I will make is uh, this my uh, current project I'm working on, on this uh, uh, DARPA funded project, in which we are trying to do is to help programmers to auto-complete um, programs. So imagine if you are writing a piece of code or a program uh, by analyzing large amounts of data, this system will be able to help you to finish your code with three goals. One is to minimize um, vulnerabilities, make sure that the code is robust, and also improve productivity. Um, these are just some numbers of the data that we are using. It's a lot of source code from different projects, about 340, uh, almost 400,000 projects, um, about four, 14 terabytes of original data, uh, corresponding to 125 roughly million files. And one of our partners in this project, this is a very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, research project. One of our um, of our partners just recently processed one billion lines of code. So it's a really large scale analytics uh, project. Um, again, these are some of the different teams that are involved, from the what the programmer receives, and how this all this data goes through the through our uh, cloud based infrastructure and returns results for the for the users. Um, this is again some of the all different from data sources, how this data is being uh, processed, metadata is extracted, different abstraction representations are then stored in our analytics database. This is one, uh, one case. What you see on your left is the uh, uh, a segment, a partial segment of a source code in C. And on your right are different abstractions. So you can have, for example, natural language that basically just the name of the functions or comments within the text. You can have input output examples or skeletons of functions, the signatures on, on, of functions, the output, uh, API, API traces, and so on and so forth. So just to keep in mind that this is, a, again, coming from the original data set and creating different transformations and different representation. This is a very challenge, uh, challenging uh, um, environment. This is a, we have a, another partner in this project, is this company. Lidos, and they are the ones curating these data sets. And here, what you see on this drop drop down box uh, on on the left, is just some of the metadata. I'm not going to go into the details, but again, it's a very rich, a very really rich uh, data set. So I would like to conclude by um, making four main points. So data curation is critical for improving access, 
share this data and also use this data. Um, and in, in this way, it's very important the, the idea of developing and disseminating this, uh, these methods and this software so that other people from the community can um, benefit. That was one of the uh, lessons learned from, from the case of the, the biomedical uh, big data. Um, there is also, because data is constantly changing, uh, especially with the amount of data that is being generated that the people have uh, or we can have, uh, the need for improving and strengthening the practices in data curation and governance. What are the standards that are going to be used? Who is uh, responsible for making sure that the data is reliable? And so on and so forth. With the ultimate goal of uh, accelerating discovery. And this is really what I believe in this ecosystem of data curation, the environment or ecosystem in which this interpretation and collaboration and sharing data sharing takes place, and the discovery. And this is, in summary, what I believe that makes possible, like as I started my talk with this concept of beauty in data. Without all this uh, thing that takes place under the hood, these beautiful discoveries wouldn't be possible. Um, I just would like to thank all the different people, institutions, collaborators, funding agencies. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, especially this time, the Tapia Center uh, and, and, and Leticia for inviting me to share with you this uh, uh, 